listening to the Saturday evening radio show with Alex Fox, Furry Down Under Special. The peculiar quandary of Simon Canopus Artile and Changes for the Better by Kevin Frame. To furry, to furry readers, both time tested and new, thanks for giving me the chance to do what I love to do. The peculiar, the peculiar quandary of Simon Canopus Artile. One, the flaw that makes the masterpiece. For most of his wizarding life, Simon Canopus Artile lived in the same splendid little house that was nestled up against the trunk of a giant tree. The tree was an Effian was an Effian oak, only it was much larger than any normal Effian oak should be, having grown to its inordinate size due to the fact that Simon had spent over two centuries living in proximity to it, and magic flowed through Simon more readily than it did most people, including other wizards. When a wizard lives anywhere, though, Giant tree or no, a full-fledged community typically community typically grows up around them. Within five or six decades, since as a general rule, a wizard is very a wizard is a very good thing for any town to have. And after this happens, most wizards decide against packing up and leaving, since the inevitable will inevitably happen will inevitably happen again, and most simply can't be bothered to make the effort anyway. Simon, in addition to being a wizard, was also a fox. To judge only by the outward appearance of his vampire features, one might, one might guess him to be 29 or 30, but he was in fact 263 years old, which was respectable, though for a wizard certainly not all that ancient. Most people who knew him didn't know exactly how old he was, just as it is improper to ask a lady her age, so too is it improper to ask a wizard. But they all knew that he was a fair shake, that he was a fair shake older than appearances let on. Valoring Dunwich was a well-mannered vixen who was slightly younger than Simon looked. She was the second eldest daughter of Mayor Dunwich, the kindly fox who for the past few decades had been in charge of Karina. Of Karina, the town had the town that had sprung up around Simon's home some two hundred years prior. Some two hundred years prior. She came to see Simon several times a week, usually bring some kind of homemade cakes or biscuits to eat along with afternoon tea and if Simon didn't emerge from his house for over a week or so, for over, his, for over a week or so, she would bring by two armfuls of groceries, since sometimes Simon had a tendency to forget to eat whenever his assistant, Anton, was out on one of his many errands to fetch books, trinkets, and other assorted whistly things from distant, from distant locales. Growing up, Simon had never been one to notice whether or not he was the kind of person to draw the attention of vixens like a Valerine because he spent most of his time with his muzzle stuck in a book and very little of it watching the ladies. It didn't seem that many other people noticed him either because having one's muzzle stuck in a book makes one difficult to see. People did notice his love of old People did notice his love of old text and of libraries and of ancient artefacts, which which were really little more than overglorified nicknames, <clears throat> which were which were really little which were really little more than overglorified knickknacks, and it didn't surprise anyone when he stated at a very young age his desire to become a wizard some day. What did surprise him was the fact that he actually had the talent to become one, to become one. Becoming a wizard takes more than a simple desire to do so, and not everyone has what some people call the gift. Simon did have this gift, though he person 
though he personally didn't think of it as anything terribly special. Anything terribly special. To Simon, magic just came naturally, both in the sense of skills, developing without much trouble, and also in the sense that magic itself, due to the fox's peculiar nature, did indeed come to him, in which the same way that metal is drawn to a magnet. Sometimes metal was drawn to wizards too, but this usually only happens if their attention is distracted while they're in the midst of channeling a certain degree of mystical power. People who are people who people who are sensitive to things mystical would often claim that he even smelled of magic. Those who weren't would claim that he just smelled of jasper. By the age of twelve, Simon had signed his contract binding him to the laws of the magician's charter, a millennia old document, repeatedly amended and revised though it was. That, confide, that, co, that, codified, that codified what was and what was not allowable for a wizard of any realm to do. Simon was never one to cause trouble or mischief like any other young foxes of his hometown, and so following the rules was not at issue, and in fact centuries later, Simon himself would go on to register his own amendments and revisions to the charter. It was Simon's love of books, attention to detail, and wizardly acumen that quickly led to his becoming a historian, specifically a historian of magic, and one day the grand historian of magic, wizarding, and spellcraft. Truth be told, the word Truth be told, the world quite needed someone to fill the role of magical historian in Simon's time, but that hadn't been a concern of but that hadn't been a concern of his when he'd make the decision to do it anyway. Writing new texts about the history of magic was a daunting task, one which required the reading of many, many old texts along with the ability to translate old languages that few people spoke anymore and in at least two cause and at and in at least two cases a bulk of text in language that nobody spoke anymore which necessi which necessitated the use of magic itself to even glean the meaning of those forgotten words Simon was competent he loved what he did and it gave him plenty of occasions to keep his muscle firmly wedged between the pages of book after book. The thing that most often got his muscle out from those books was Valerine. Whenever Valerine would visit, their conversations could go on for several hours, with her talking about the latest town gossip, and him telling her about cursive variants of mystic runes from the Neopardine Age which she didn't quite follow, but in which she attempted to interest all the same, or all, all the same, or about fabulous extinct creatures called dragons, which she found which she found dreadfully frightening, yet enthralling to hear about. She didn't have two and a half centuries worth of knowledge in her head, but she was quick to catch on, and quick to chuckle whenever Simon would insert one of his all too rare jokes into a conversation into a conversation and he would always smile a handsome smile when and he would always smile a handsome smile when she did that. Valerine was pretty too. She was the sort of vixen that just about every male fox in town, save Simon himself, was very keen on courting. Simon didn't notice the significance of the fact that she turned down all the suitors and continued to bring him tasty cakes, but then Simon wasn't much of a usual fox either. He did, however, notice and acknowledge that she was very pretty at least, and he had told her on more one and and he had told her on more than one occasion that she was very lovely or that she was wearing a very lovely dress, or that she had a very lovely smile. Invariably, though, 
Invariably, though, about two or three times each afternoon, they spend to, they spend. Invariably, though, about two or three times each afternoon they spent together, Simon would find himself staring at the little blemish of white fur on the right side of a muzzle. The tiny white patch was nestled amidst a swath of, a swath of soft russet and would, a swath of soft russet and would have hardly been noticeable at first glance, but that teensy break in red always drew Simon's attention, and he couldn't help but wonder, as he looked at it, why it was there. After a few seconds of Simon staring, Valerine would take notice, and she would, and she would blush and turn her head away as she tried to hide a smiling. It made her very happy to know that Simon could lose his train of thought while looking at her face. Simon, she said one day, after she'd caught him staring a bit more than usual. You seem a bit distracted lately. Are you doing all right? Hmm? Oh yes, fine, Simon replied, shaking his head as he snapped back to reality. I suppose I'm just turning a lot of information around in my head. I've begun, I've begun work on a rather demanding section of my latest book. Valerie smiled, but looked as though that hadn't been the answer she'd been expecting. Which book was that again? she asked. The Complete Collected Biographies of the Ducal Wizards of Ulegard. Simon was quite proud of his progress on that one, as tracking down much of the material had been costly and time-consuming, and once the book was complete, it would mark the first time ever that all that information would be available in one place. Not even Ulagard itself had managed to keep track of it all. It's quite fascinating, really, he explained. Did you know that for over four did you know that for over four centuries they actually had a system whereby law each successor to the office could not be of the same gender as the wizard who preceded them? No, I didn't know that, Valerine said, not really knowing much about Ducal wizards at all. I take it that's an odd practice, though. Quite odd, Simon affirmed. I'm amazed that anyone from such an enlightened background, from such an enlightened background, could ever think that gender would have any hearing on, well, anything, really. Valerine chuckled. You should say that to my father, she said. He tells me that it's not my place as a lady to take over to take over male duties from him once he's gotten to once he's gotten too old. Hmm, Simon murmured, scratching his chin in thought. I don't think you'd do a very good job as mayor, honestly. The vixen's eyes widened. You don't, she asked. Sounding hurt and just a tad ang and you don't she asked, sounding hurt and just a tad angry. You don't think I have what it takes? I don't think that I don't think you have the cold edge that you need to govern something, and I don't think you'd be able, and I don't think you'd be able to handle circumstances that keep you, to handle circumstances that kept you from being able to make everybody happy. All of the time, Simon explained with another of his smiles. You're far too nice after all. After a pause, he added, I like you that way. At that, Valerine softened and then almost melted. Well, th thank you, she said, avoiding eye contact for a moment or two. It's very kind of you to s it's for a moment or two. It's very kind of you to say that. It's very kind of you to visit me and bring me things to eat without tea, Simon said. I'm afraid my best attempts at baking have fallen short of even the worst of what you've brought me. You've brought me. Though Valerie's snout wrinkled for a moment at that last part, she realised that it was still meant as a compliment, and so she smiled. Speaking of which, she said, beginning to 
Speaking of which, she said, beginning to gather up the basket she'd brought along, what would you like me to bring next time? Simon took a moment to think. Something with honey, I think, he said. Anton brought in a new tea last week that I think would complement the flavour very nicely. The wizard found himself staring at the tiny white blemish on the vixen's muzzle. Valerine failed to hide her blush. Honey, it is then, she said, standing up. In two days' time, shall we say, I know you've got your ducal wizards to write about. The ducal wizards won't be too upset, I should think, Simon replied. After all, most of them are dead. Valerine's eyes twinkled as she curtsied, as she curtsied, still embodying the as she curtsied, still embodying the epitome of ladylikeness. Until then, Master Artile, I bid you good evening. Simon nodded and bowed, showed the young woman out, and then turned back to his study. Anton chose that, Anton chose that moment to re-emerge from the anterior study. He was always welcome to take tea with Simon and his guests, but when Valerine was over, he found excuses to make himself scarce because to make himself scarce because he too had noticed the way that Simon seemingly took great interest in a lovely face. Ah, Anton, Simon said, seeing the raccoon step out into the hall. Miss Dunwich left a piece of lemon cake for you if you're hungry. Dinners are still few hours away, after all. Anton, Am Anton Amy Clydes was officially Simon's assistant, though he hoped that one day he might be the fox's apprentice. The raccoon had some minor magical talent of his own, but nothing that yet demonstrated that he was ready to become a wizard. This was part of why he'd been assigned to Simon in the first place. In case it turned out that in case it turned out that that aptitude, in case it turned out that that aptitude could be honed after all, already though Anton was, already though Anton was pushing forty, and it looked like the chances of his tapping any greater, the chances of his tapping any greater mystical power were slim. Stranger things had happened, however, and the re Stranger things had happened, however, and the raccoon still voiced from time to time his hope he might come one day realise that dream. That's very kind of her, he said to Simon. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to join you two. It looks like I just missed her. Oh, she'll be... Oh, she'll be by... Oh, she'll be by again the day after tomorrow, Simon said, leading on he... Leading... <coughs> Oh, she'll be by again the day after tomorrow, Simon said, leading on into his main library, completely missing the flinch on the raccoon's on the raccoon's face when he did that. You'll get the chance to see her then. I think I'll be serving that nice tea you brought back from Ephaya. Anton shuffled as he fell into step behind the fox, wringing his paws together. Master R... Master Ar <coughs> Anton shuffled as he fell into step behind the fox, wringing his paws together. Master Artile, wringing his paws together. Master Artile, he asked, voice tensing as he broached the subject. If you and the lady would prefer to be alone, you know that's all you need to do if... If you and the lady would prefer to be alone, you know that all you need do is ask. Alone, Simon asked, turning around to look back at his assistant. Oh, Anton, don't be silly. You know that Miss Dunwich likes you just fine. You're always welcome to sit with us. Well, hopefully next time then, Anton said with a polite nod. I was at least able to get able to get through two more stacks of that documentation from Ulagard 
this afternoon. I've got it all catalogued and ready for when you start writing tonight. Simon said he writing tonight. Simon sat at his desk and looked at the working copy of his manuscript. Two stacks, you say, he asked, finding his place. That should get me through all of tomorrow and the morning after, I think. Anton appeared to do some math in his head and then smiled. There was bound to be a lot of housework for him to do in the meantime. Simon knew, and he hoped the raccoon could handle it all. A pleasure to be of service, Master Artile, he said with a bow. Shall I get started on dinner now then? Oh, there's no rush, Sun replied with a wave of his paw. Why don't you grab that slice of cake from the sitting room and bring it in here and we can sit and talk for a bit? You've been so busy since you've come back. I feel like I've... Since you've come back, I feel like I've hardly gotten five minutes alone with you. Simon noticed the raccoon's ears flush up a bright pink on the insides. The fox had been busy, though, as well, and he probably hadn't voiced his honest and he probably hadn't and he probably hadn't voiced his honest thanks and appreciation, and so he was and so he was very glad indeed for the chance to retire to the sitting room with a fresh piece of cake and some conversation. The next day, while Simon was in the middle of scribing the history of the Ducal Wizards of Ulagard, he was visited upon by a messenger from the lesser barony of Gundry. This miss of Gundry, this emissary, a very flustered coyote with unkempt fur on his head, spoke hurriedly as he relayed his lord's request to beseech the great master Artile to lend his aid by working his magic to prevent a dam from bursting, which was, the local experts all said, due to happen any day now. It was Simon's policy, as it was the policy of many wizards, to not interfere with the dealings of the day-to-day -day world, nor to influence the way in which natural events were meant to play out. For example, several times over the past few decades alone, Simon, past few decades alone, Simon had been asked to intervene on, Simon had been asked to intervene on the behalf of, on the behalf of kingdoms in order to, of kingdoms in order to bring a swift end to wars, or to end plagues and famines, or to end plagues and famines. And while that was all within the fox's power, and while there was nothing in the magician's charter expressing, there was nothing in the magician's charter expressly forbidding such acts, it was just an unwritten rule amongst wizards like Simon that such things were simply not done. In this particular case, however, upon being informed that the town that lay beneath said dam housed a library full of many centuries worth of ancient tummies and scrolls and tablets, Simon decided to let that unwritten rule slide, if only this once. He de this once, he, de he dematerialized himself from his cosy home in Carina, rematilla in Carina, rematerialized himself at the dam in Gundry, cast a series of spells to magically strengthen the wood and stone against wear and strain, and then whisked and then whisked himself back to his home in time for Anton to serve him a very succulent roast. At some point he noted to himself he ought to see what knowledge that library held before it got wiped out in a fire or rock slide or other such disaster. Or other such disaster. The Gundrite, the Gundrite emissary, upon hearing of Simon's distant deeds, promised that his lord would send a chest of gold and gems forthwith, and the fox nodded politely, not looking forward to that reward nearly as much as he was tea and cakes with ballerine on the morrow. 
After dining, however, when Simon was about ready to get back to his writing, Anton came back with a small pile of papers. With a small pile of papers. Master Artile, he asked, before the fox could settle and get comfortable at his desk. And get comfortable at his desk. I found something among... I found something among the Ulagard papers that caught my eye, and I was wondering if I might get your opinion on it, just for curiosity's sake, if you're not in a hurry. On it, just for curiosity... On it, just... On it, just for curiosity's sake, if you're not busy. Simon smiled. He was always happy when he's... He was always happy when he, assistant, showed both aptitude and interest in the craft of a historian. The raccoon of a historian. The raccoon might never go on to become a wizard, he thought, but he might at least be a but he might at least be a passable and passionate scholar to make up for it. Certainly, he said to Anton. Tell me what you found. Anton nodded, clearing his throat. <clears> have you happened have you happened upon have you happened upon the have you happened upon the case of Formax Fornas's upon the upon the case of Formax Formas's Tenebron yet? he asked. I recall the name, Simon replied. He was one of the Ducal wizards of Ulagard's son. Oh, 1200 years ago. If I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, but I don't think I've come across anything specific, but I don't think, <clears throat> but I don't think I've come across, but I don't think I've come across anything specific about him in particular. Yes, well, Anton began checking the papers to make sure he had his facts right. Master Tenebrun had, among other things, among other things of, among, among other things of course, decreed and carried out a sentence of, decreed, other things of course, decreed and carried out a sentence of annulment on one of the wizards under his jurisdiction, he said. Simon nodded, urging him to continue. At any rate, the raccoon continued, the punishment was meted in response to the use of mind control on a nobleman. Such a sentence, at least in this case, was not unusual. Using mind-altering magic on another living being without due cause, nobleman or not, was cause for a wizard to be stripped of his mystical powers in addition to his memories, and Simon agreed a little over a millennium later, that this Formax Fornasus, Fornax Fornasus Tenebron had made the proper decision in the matter. Are you surprised that the punishment was not more severe then? He asked Anton. Insofar as the crime was perpetrated against a member of the nobility? Oh, not at all, Anton quickly responded. I've read enough of your writings on Ulagard to know that they were not known to be unduly harsh in their sentencing. The raccoon seemed to squirm as he searched for his next set of words. It's just that there were rumours, the accounts say, that the crime was motivated by, um, love. Crimes are often motivated by love, Simon noted. That's not quite the point I was making, Anton said, and this time he wrung his paws together. My point was, rather that the text names the wizard in question as male, and the victim was a nobleman. Was a nobleman. <coughs> and the victim was a nobleman. The look on Anton's face told Simon, after a few seconds, that the good master Artar wasn't quite seeing where the conversation was logically supplo where the conversation was logically supposed to lead. Whether where the seeing where the conversation was logically supposed to lead. I'm not quite 
I'm not sure quite what your question is, the fox asked. Oh, it's not really a question, the raccoon said. I was just wondering what your thoughts on the matter were. Well, Simon pondered aloud, leaning back in his chair. In Ulagard at the time, there was an undue sense of significance placed on gender when it came to many of their dealings. So then you think that may have had a bearing on the way that, on the way that the Ducal wizard handled the case? I suppose it's possible, Simon acknowledged. Though in this particular case, I doubt that, as we've already mentioned, the punishment was fitting with the crime. No, in this case, I think that, I think that the unnecessary importance of gender may be part of the reason why the crime was committed in the first place. Anton didn't look certain at first, but then he appeared very glad for that response. That's, that's a very keen insight, Master Artile, he said. I don't know that if I would have thought of that, that I would have thought of that on my own. I'm not too sure, Simon replied with a smile. Something about the case obviously grabbed your attention, and so I think you would have formulated your... I think you would have formulated your own conclusion eventually. The next... Eventually. The next day, though, when... A, <coughs> Eventually, eventually, the next day, though, when Valerie Dunwich showed up with her honey-scented cakes, Anton made himself scarce, and when he heard, and when he heard the two foxes laughing together in the other, showed up with her honey-scented cakes, Anton made himself scarce, and when he heard the two foxes laughing together in the other room, he decided that he wouldn't show himself again until the mayor's daughter was gone. Simon and Valerine thought it unfortunate that Anton had to be so busy while they were in while there was had to be so busy while there was enjoyment to be had. Valerine thought it slightly less unfortunate that Simon did. Just as Simon had predicted, the tea from Ephaya went perfectly with Valerine's cakes, the combination quite delicious. Quite delicious. After all, Simon explained, complimenting the vixen on her cooking, even a wizard can't know how to create tastes he's never experienced before. That's very kind of you to say, Master Artile, Valerine said, dipping her head in a humble bow. I wanted very much for you to like them after you seemed so eager the other day. I do like them, Simon reaffirmed. I like them very much. To that, Valerine blushed, and when she averted her gaze for modesty's sake, Simon got a full-on look at that white patch on the side of a muscle, his eyes fixing in on it. Valerine noticed too and she looked even further askance. Are you staring, Master Artile? She asked coyly and politely, without a hint of any real accusation in her voice. Oh, some, I suppose, Simon, <coughs> in her voice. Oh, some, I suppose, Simon admitted, <coughs> in her voice. Oh, some, I suppose, Simon admitted, feeling a tad bashful himself at having been caught. I do hope I haven't offended you. Not at all, Valerine replied, cleverly adjusting her collar as she straightened up in her chair. I should think a wizard must have a discerning eye, and that if something catches his attention, he must deem it worth his notice. Simon felt a new flush of embarrassment and guilt. Well, I mean, he started, stammering, losing his words for a moment. I know it's... I know it's not polite to stare, but I just haven't been able to help it. He paused a moment, met her eyes, and then asked more quietly, 
you're certain you don't mind. Valoring countered. Valoring countered his hesitation with a sly smile. Quite certain. The male fox held up his... Quite certain. The male fox held up his hand for a moment, then let it fall again. He felt wrong to even ask, but blurted the words out anyway. Would it be all right if I took a closer look? Valerie stopped her tail from moving and paused a moment before saying, Only if you'd like to. I would, Simon replied, voice just above a whisper. He got a whisper. He got to his <clears throat> voice just above a whisper. He got to his feet and walked around the table, approaching Valerie like a nervous child might approach an angry parent. She turned and looked up at him as he got nearer, and she resisted the urge to stand, instead remaining seated so that Simon had to kneel down in order to get his closer look. To get his closer look. The racing of Valerine's heart got faster and faster as Simon drew closer and closer. He bent at one knee and brought his muzzle in close to hers, searching her eyes before searching her features, and then he went to that blemish on her snout. One of his paws came up to her cheek, and she closed her eyes as she cupped that side of her muscle, fingers covering up that bit of white. Simon's breath was even and steady, and his breath was warm, just as his touch was warm. His breath got warmer then, and so too did his touch, and in a matter of moments, his touch was radiating a heat that wasn't natural. It was pleasant, though, and Simon could feel that she felt a soothing sensation wash over her, making her turn to herself in a haze of contentment. Then, just before Simon might have cut down, might have cut down that gap between them, the wizard took his paw away and rose back onto his feet. There, he said with a proud smile on his face, all better. Valerine brought her own paw to the spot on her face that Simon had touched. It didn't feel warm anymore. What's all better? She asked, confusion melting together with her dis She asked, confusion melting together with her disappointment. You just had a bit of a, a thing here on your muscle, Simon said, pointing to his own face to illustrate the spot where the tiny blemish no longer existed. White amongst the red, nothing too bad, to be honest, but it's all gone now. Simon frowned, because at that point, Valerine frowned. At that point, Valerine frowned, I... I see, the vixen fibbed. I, well, thank you, I guess. Oh, not, oh, not a problem at all, Simon said, taking his seat once more before refilling his teacup. It's always a pleasure to help out a lovely, to help, it's always a pleasure to help out a lovely young lady such as yourself. Valerine was less talkative than usual after that, and she cut Valerine was less talkative than usual after that, and she cut her afternoon visit abruptly short. And she cut and she cut her af <coughs> than usual after Valerine <coughs> Valerine was less talkative than usual after that and she cut her afternoon visit abruptly short, citing, abruptly short, citing duties back at the male, at the male manor, <coughs> at the male manor that she needed to attend to. She still left some dessert for Anton, but she didn't prearrange another day to stop by again when she departed. In the week that followed, Valerie did continue to visit, to visit, but things weren't the same as they had been before. 
She seemed stifled and awkward around Simon and often let the train of conversation die. Simon, too, had difficulties from then on. Difficulties from then on. Since he'd fixed up that one tiny inconsistency on his female companion's face, there were companion's face, there were no other imperfections to draw his attention. The vixen's face was perfect, and that meant that his work was done, and that he should have been proud, but he didn't feel too proud of himself at all. After all, Valerie didn't seem much happier from having been fixed up, and Simon himself found that somehow he missed the way that he used to the way that he used to just stop and stare at the young lady's face. Two, foresight, hindsight, and insight. Simon noticed that Valerie's mood took a turn for the angry after that, not very angry. But as she had always been so nice and pleasant and happy, the shift in demeanour, the shift in demeanour was obvious. Anton must have, Anton must have noticed it too, Simon thought, because the raccoon was never short on excuses to make himself scarce whenever Valerine came around, even if it was with little or no <coughs> came around, even if it was with even if it was with little or whenever <coughs> Anton must have noticed it too, Simon thought, because the raccoon was never because the raccoon was never short on excuses to make himself scarce whenever Valerine came around even if it was with little or no notice. One afternoon, when Valerine had stopped by for the first time in nearly a week, Simon found himself feeling very short on patience with her. She gave, she gave brusque, half-hearted responses to his questions, and her tea cakes were far less tasty. Tea cakes were far less tasty than they had been since Simon had fixed her face. Simon had never been a man to have a temper, but he grew frustrated as the afternoon went on and eventually got so worked up with annoyance that he did something that he that he did so <coughs> that that he did something that he hadn't done in over six decades. He purposefully lied to someone. I'm really sorry, he said to Valerine with a sigh, wiping his brow with the back of his paw before straightening out the forelocks of his fur there. I've got an important experiment that I'm running tonight. It's very finicky and it's very finicky and it needs to be completed at precisely the stroke of midnight. And so I really ought to go back and help Anton with the preparations. He stole a glance, he saw a glance at his half-eaten biscuit and then had to fake a complete smile. I do hope you'll be able to come by again in a few days. Valerie nodded, but the nod was <coughs> by again in a by again in a few days. Valerie nodded, but the nod was as curt as the responses she'd been given all as responses she'd been giving all afternoon. Of course, she said with a smile that Simon Guest was as false as his own. My father's been very busy lately, and he's been asking me to help him out with a lot of things, but I'm sure I'll be able to make time for you, Master Artile. Those last words lingered with Simon for several minutes after Valerine has left. For several for, for several minutes after Valerine had left. Simon had left. Simon didn't go to fetch Anton right away. Instead, he paced around his study, rolling those words over and over in his mind. If she's mad at me, I wish she'd just tell me already so I wouldn't 
have to guess, he thought to himself. It was then when Simon first realised the true extent to which he was upset by the notion that Valerie might no longer like him. When it came time, like him, when it came time for some future wizard to write the biography of Simon Canapasartile, would lifelong bachelor be among his titles appended to his name? It occurred to Simon that, barring accidents or things meant to appear as accidents, he might expect to live for several more centuries, if not long, for several for, for several more centuries, if not longer. That was a lot of time in which to catalogue an awful lot of history, but it was also a lot of time to spend by oneself, even if the company of books was not to be discounted. To be discounted. Anton, the fox called out, wandering back out into his sitting room, sinking into his couch. Anton, could you come out here for a bit? The raccoon poked his head out through the door that led to the main library. Sir, he asked, voice hesitant as he looked back and forth around the sitting room. It's all right. It's all right, Simon reassured him. Miss Dunwich has gone home early this afternoon. I see, Anton said, clutching his paws together as he stepped out into the room, slowly approaching Simon. I do hope that she's not unwell. The wizard let out a wry chuckle. I'm sure she's perfectly fine, at least as far as her health goes, he replied. No, I actually just sent her home. I didn't feel... I didn't feel much like being around her today. Anton's ears perked straight up. Is something wrong, Master Artile? He asked, shuffling closer still. I hope the young lady hasn't upset you in some way. No, Simon said. But then he quickly changed his response to, well, yes. He looked back at Anton, deciding that his assistant's he looked back at Anton, deciding that his assistant was someone he could confide in. Was someone he could con <coughs> He looked back at Anton, deciding that his assistant was someone he could confide in. He looked He looked back at Anton, deciding that his assistant was someone he could confide in. Come here and sit down. I'd like to talk to you about something. The raccoon looked as nervous as Simon had ever been. The raccoon looked as nervous as Simon had ever seen him look as he crossed the room and took his seat on the couch. His breathing was quick and audible, and his tail didn't keep still even after and his tail didn't keep still, even after he'd sat down. What is it, Master Artile? he asked. Simon looked hard for the words he wanted. For the words he wanted. He wasn't used to thinking about things like this, let alone... about things like this, let alone vocalising them. He wasn't... <coughs> He wasn't used to thinking about things like this, let alone like this, like <clears throat> like this, let alone vocalising them. Still, he knew that he wasn't going to find any answers in a book, so it wouldn't hurt to check and see if he might not and see if he might not find them in a raccoon. Well, you know that Miss Dunwich has been a very Miss Dunwich has been a very frequent visitor here these last <coughs> a very a very frequent very a very frequent visitor here these visitor visitor here these last several months, he said. Well, you know that Miss Dunwich has been a very frequent visitor here a very frequent visitor here these last several months, he said, and Anton just nodded. This next part was tough for him to say. I think that the young lady might have been trying to win my affections. 
the look on Anton's face went from went from one of the look on Anton's face went from one of nervousness to one of gravity and shock. Might have been you say, he asked, a tremble hiding in part of his voice, as in she's no longer trying to? No, I don't believe so, Solomon replied, shaking his head. That was, that was, <clears throat> no, I don't believe so, Solomon replied, shaking his head. That much was particularly clear today. The raccoon clenched and unclenched his paws several times. You're upset about this, I take it, he asked, suddenly looking as though his knees were the most interesting things he'd ever seen. Not so much, actually, Simon said, and Anton's ears perked right back up again. I mean, I appreciate her interest in some sense, but I wish that she could... But I wish that she could be more graceful about us all now. It's not like we can't be friends. So, Anton squeaked. He was visibly shaking now. Simon, honestly curious about what Anton had to say, gave him a look to this effect, and so the raccoon... <coughs> to this effect, and so the raccoon steadied his voice and continued. I'm sorry, I'm just a bit confused. I'd been under the impression that you and Miss Dunwich got along swimmingly. We do, Son replied, or at least we did. I get the impression that she'd been... I get the impression that she'd been hoping that we'd be past the swimming and on... past the swimming and on to other things by now. Anson took a few slow breaths. She just doesn't strike your fancy in that way, he said, in that way, your fancy in that, your fancy in that way, he said guardedly. Oh, don't get me wrong, the fox continued, leaning back more into the sofa, leaning back more into the sofa, looking dedic, <coughs> leaning back, leaning back more into the sofa, looking decidedly less wizard-like as he slouched. She's certainly very lovely, and she's more than nice enough, well, barring the last week or two. But I just... you just... Simon sighed again. You just... Simon sighed again and clicked his tongue. I'm not sure, he said. Pretty young vixens like her don't come along all that often in a century, and the fox part of me and the fox part of me tells me that I should be jumping at the opportunity, but it just doesn't feel right. But it just doesn't feel right, not with her. He looked into Anton's eyes, then rested a paw on the raccoon's shoulder. I don't suppose that makes any sense to you, does it? The raccoon looked back at him breathless looked back at him breathless, eyes wide and quivering. I... I don't think it sounds all that strange, he said, pausing a moment before quickly amending his response with, Master Artile, with a chuckle, Simon brightened up. See? That's what I like about you, Anton. The wizards... That's what I like about you, Anton. The wizards sat, patting the raccoon's shoulder. You always just say what's on your mind and you don't worry about saying it. His smile widened. Maybe if Valerine were a bit more like you, I wouldn't have this silly problem. Have this silly problem. Anton chuckled too, but it was... Anton chuckled too, but it was tinged with more hints of nervousness. Oh, I'm sure you wouldn't want Vela, Miss Dunwich, to be too much like me, he said. Like me, he said, breaking eye contact. Still, it's... His voice trailed off, though, and he didn't have anything else to add. Simon pulled himself out of his slouch, and he offered Anton one more smile before getting to his feet.
Don't sell yourself short, young man, he said, tail wagging as he stretched his legs, already feeling much, much better. You've got plenty to you've got plenty to be proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Anton mumbled, remaining seated as Simon started his way back to the library. Oh, Master Artile, he then called out, getting the fox's attention before he was out. He then called out, getting the fox's attention before he was out of earshot. Fighting his way past an orchid gaze, he said, If you ever need to, you know, talk about anything else that's on your mind, you're more than welcome to. I'll do that, Simon replied with another smile, and then he went back to his books for the evening. As it turned out, Simon did not end up talking to Anton about anything else that was on his mind, at least not in any pointed sense. It was almost... <clears throat> it was almost a non-issue, though, because as Simon reflected further on the raccoon's refreshing honesty, he felt like the two of them had gotten closer and more comfortable, and in the days that followed, things around the house were very that followed, things around the house were very pleasant indeed. Anton was in exceptionally good spirits as well, and the raccoon went so far as to went so far and the raccoon went so far as to just happen to run into one of Mayor Dunwich's other daughters, Maria, and asked her what ingredients her sister used in her honey cakes. It has been a long time since Simon had felt so carefree about life. For once, the great solace and satisfaction that he got out of writing actually paled in comparison to how he's in comparison to how he felt when he had lunch and dinner with Anton. The two of them laughed and joked and told stories, with Simon having quite a bit more to tell a bit more to tell than Anton, thinking more about the years that stretched ahead of him than Anton. <coughs> than, An <coughs> than, than Anton. Thinking more about the years that stretched ahead of him, though, Master Artile wished that his assistant might that his assistant might decide to stop calling him Master Artile all the time, especially when things had become so laid black especially when things had become so laid back and casual after so long. Simon also channeled his newfound exuberance into other things. He started to run some more of his own errands partly because he had more free time since his writing was going so smoothly, but also because he didn't want to make Anton do all the extra work. While out and about the streets of Carina, Simon made it a point to smile at the younger lady foxes, and whenever he caught their eyes, he saw signs that they'd been waiting for him to do so for quite some time, and Simon usually then returned home with an extra spring in his step or some extra wag in his tail. The town really did have more than its in his tail. The town really did more have <coughs> his tail wag in his tail. The town really did have more than its fair share of fair vixens, the wizard now realised, and he thought himself lucky in that regard, and he thought himself and he thought himself lucky in that regard, even if the one with whom he was best acquainted was on the offs with him. A week from the day offs with him, a week from the day of Valerie's last visit. Simon was in very good last visit. Simon was in a very good mood <coughs> was in a very good was in a very good mood. The Ulagard biographies were progressing 
Ulegaard biographies were progressing at a good clip, at a good clip and feeling a resurgence of confidence, Simon informed Anton that he'd spent Simon informed Anton that he'd sent an invitation for Miss Dunwich to come over for dinner the next day. And I'd very much like for you to join us, Simon told the raccoon. In fact, I insist that you in fact I insist that you put aside any projects of mine that you're working on and just take the evening off. It confused Simon that Anton didn't look happier. You're inviting Miss Dunwich over for dinner? he asked. That is what I said, yes, Simon replied, laughing and smiling. I thought maybe perhaps <coughs> and smiling. I thought maybe perhaps I could help with the cooking. Miss Dunwich can bring a dessert and we should all have a very nice evening together. But I thought that thought that I was still a bit annoyed with her, Simon asked. I admit that I was, yes, but I've had some time to think about it, and I surmise that she and I surmise that she's probably that she's probably had enough time to stop being upset with me, he said. Besides, if I ever did decide that, perhaps Miss Stunwich wasn't such a bad catch for a mate after all. I'd hate after all, I'd hate not to be friends with her. That'd be frightfully awkward. Anton's face fell, and Simon felt his fur startling to tingle all over, from ears to tail. Wait, the raccoon stammered. No, you said that... You said... Simon was worried. Anton looked so hurt and confused, and the fox couldn't think of a reason why his inviting Valerie to dinner would speak such a reaction. I said what? he asked, tilting his head. You said that it that it didn't feel right, Anton said, his ears flattening back against his head, his voice starting to creak and crack. A touch of jasper tickled Simon's nose, and his fur stood further up on end. And you said that that you wished that maybe Anton, please, calm down, Simon said, reaching out to place his paw on the raccoon's shoulder. It's only dinner. But Simon's paw, it's only dinner, but Simon's paw never made it to Anton's shoulder because the raccoon smacked the fox's arm <coughs> to Anton's shoulder because the raccoon smacked the fox's arm away. It is not only dinner, Anton shouted. And then it was Simon's turn to lay his ears back as the room echoed with a loud crack, not quite as sharp as a thunderclap, but slower, more like the sound of a heavy branch snapping loose from a tree in a windstorm. The scent of Jasper began to fade, but the tingling, tickling sensation still hung around Simon's fur, and his halt... <coughs> tickling sensation still hung around Simon's fur and his head ached worse than it had and his head ached worse than it had in a century. Tolerance to alcohol, it is worth noting, was not something that Simon would never be known was not something that Simon would never was was not something that Simon would ever be known for. His vision was blurry and his vision was blurry and he was seeing double, in the sense that he was looking back at himself, as himself, looking back at himself. Well, Simon said to himself, was, well, Simon said to himself, with a resigned yet satisfied grin, I suppose that answers that question. About whether Anton would ever turn out to be a... That quit. <coughs> That question about whether Anton would ever turn out to be would ever turn out to be wizard material, Simon asked back.
There's that too, the fox acknowledged. I was thinking about why Anton would be so upset. I was thinking about why Anton would be so upset about Valerie being invited over for dinner, though. Anton had already fainted, however, and so he was in no condition to offer his opinion on either point. He had not remarkably enough fainted as a result of the sudden magical outburst he just affected, but outburst he just affected, but rather at the sight of seeing he just he just affected he just affected but rather at the sight of seeing two Simons standing before him in the aftermath. Simon turned to look down at the poor raccoon. Both of his halves were moving their heads in perfect unison. <laughs> at the poor raccoon, both of his halves moving their heads in perfect unison. Maybe he just thinks... Maybe he just thinks you're very handsome, one of the... <clears throat> maybe he just thinks... Maybe he just thinks you're very handsome, one of those halves joked. I guess two of the same fox was just too much for him to bear. Stop that, the other fox said, chastising himself. This is no joking map. Stop that, the other... <clears throat> Stop that. Stop that, the other fox said, chastising himself. This is no joking matter. You don't even know if he's all right. Oh, fair enough, he conceded. And then he knelt down twice before invoking a simple charm once, rousing the raccoon back to his consciousness. His other self, the raccoon back to his un... Raccoon, the raccoon back to his consciousness. His other self gently cradled Anton's head, bringing it up into his lap. Easy, easy, he said in the best... Easy, easy, he said in the best hushed, soothing tone he could... In the best, in the best hushed, soothing tone he could master. In the best hushed... In the best hushed, soothing tone he could muster. You'll be all right. You just blacked out for a moment there. Simon, Anton asked, voice and eyes both bleary as he looked at the fox hovering over him before turning his head to look at the fox holding him up. Simon, he... Holding him up. Simon, he asked again. Simon let out... <coughs> he asked... He asked again. Simon let out... <coughs> He asked again. Simon let out a double chuckle. We can worry about that later, he said. Can you stand up? He asked, offering his other pair of paws to help the raccoon to his feet. I think so, Anton replied, still looking very dizzy and lightheaded, even as he got to his feet without any trouble. He did a literal double take and then rubbed at his temples. Did... Did I just do that to you? It's okay, Simon said. It's not your fault. Well, technically it is, he told himself. He turned and shot himself a look. Yes, but it's not... Yes, but it's not like he did anything... A look. Yes, but it's not like he did anything wrong. Not that I remember at least. He mused aloud to himself. Anton was far less <coughs> to himself. Aloud to himself. Anton was far less <coughs> to himself. Anton was far less calm, though, and he soon entered a state of panic. Oh dear, Master Artile, I am so so sorry, he said his head whipping back and forth between one fox and the other. I swear, really, I swear, I did not do this on purpose. You have to believe me on that. Don't worry, Anton, Simon insisted. Don't worry, Anton, Simon insisted, placing a paw on Anton's shoulder unhindered this time. I believe you. Besides, he said, placing another paw on the raccoon's other shoulder. 
I somehow, the raccoon's other shoulder, I somehow doubt you knew that you even could do that. That was a marked understatement because Simon, understatement because Simon had no idea that Anton could do that either. As if to underscore his lack of readiness, <clears throat> as if to underscore his lack of readiness, Anton almost fainted again, but Simon was there to catch him from both sides at once. Easy there, he murmured to the raccoon with the muzzle that was closer to his ears. Sorry, Anton muttered in reply, having to work twice as hard to avoid eye contact. This is all just a bit much, Simon thought, scratching his head as he worked up a plan, finding it a bit difficult to come to a single conclusion from two directions from two directions at once. Tell you what, he said eventually, straightening out the raccoon with one set of paws while he straightened of paws while he straightened himself up with another. Why don't you just go lie down for a little while? In the meantime, the fox added, I think that my predicament I think that my predicament might be best serve might be best <coughs> That my, that my predicament might be best served, my, my predicament might be best served by spending some time alone with myself. Despite looking like he might faint away again at any moment, Anton nodded and managed to shuffle his way along to his chamber, to his chamber. Someone watched, feeling more than just two minds about the situation but realising that he couldn't do much for his assistant until he knew what he had to do for himself. Well, this is, well, this is all just terrific, Simon said to himself once he was alone, looking at himself with disappointment in his eyes. He looked back, trying not to flinch under his own gaze, mustering up to resolve in order to combat his own stern demeanour. What do you mean by that? He said, managing to keep his voice from cracking. He felt proud of himself for that, but not as much as he could have. How is any of this... How is any of this my fault? This wouldn't have happened if you... This wouldn't have happened if you paid more attention to people, was his own simple response. You know what happens when magically inclined folk lose control of their emotions? Well, yes, but I didn't know that Anton was capable of this. And besides, it's not like I could, it's not like I could have known that he would have, it's not like, it's not like I could have known that he would have gotten so worked up over the prospect of dinner with Valerie. Simon hung his head, shaking it for shame as he looked himself over again. I'm sure you would... <coughs> as he looked himself over again. I'm sure you could have. <coughs> looked over again. Simon, sung... <coughs> Simon hung his head, shaking it for shame as he looked himself over again. I'm sure you could have, he told himself. You just let yourself ignore what you didn't want to acknowledge and now look at where it's gotten you. And now look at where it's gotten you. Look on the bright side, he offered, hoping to convince himself that things hadn't turned out as bad as all that. It's a very good thing that Anton's managed to uncork, managed to uncork the potential inside himself he might never have done that. He might never have. He might. He might never have done that if just left to his own devices. Prob to his own devices. Probably not. <coughs> to his own. To his own devices. Probably not. No, he said, nodding his head in concession. Nodding his head in concession. 
but there were probably better ways for him to stumble upon his true strength besides having his heart broken. That shut the fox up for a while, and as he tried to think of a reply, he found that it took twice as long to roll through the half as many thoughts in his head. Did I really break his heart? he asked. Well, maybe, his other self said. He's a... <clears throat> Having his heart broken. Having his heart broken. That shut the fox up for a while, and as he tried to think of a reply, he found that it took twice as long to roll enough... <clears throat> It took twice as long to roll through the half as many thoughts in his head. Did I really break his heart? He asked. Well, maybe, his other self said. And then his tone took an abrupt shift, one much, took an abrupt shift, one much more sympathetic to himself. But really, if you, but really, <clears throat> to himself, but really, if you weren't going to feel that way about him anyway, then then you were going to have a then then you were going to have to break it to him eventually. The two foxes were again silent. Both of them took seats on the couch, neither of them looking at the other, and Simon just tried to and Simon just tried to think, jumbled and disconnected thoughts failing, to make connections from one side of himself to the other. He realized then that it was going to take more than just talking to himself, talking to himself to dredge out the answers he needed. Valerie still has to come over for dinner tomorrow, he said. Indeed, he agreed. And then he got up and headed to his... <coughs> <coughs> for dinner tomorrow, he said. Indeed, he agreed. <coughs> Valerie still has to come over for dinner tomorrow, he said. Valerie still has to come over for dinner tomorrow, he said. Indeed, he agreed. And then he got up and headed to his library, one pair of paws following the other. Simon gave up on trying to think about the situations with Anton and Valerie for the rest of the evening, and instead... He concentrated his divided efforts on trying to find some way to reverse whatever it was Anton had done to him, which even Simon, expert magical historian though he was, had never even heard of. There was plenty of books and scrolls and even tablets piled up high in Simon's library, though and <coughs> In Simon's library, though and in theory, something similar had to Library. Library, though, and in theory, something similar had to have happened to at least one person, at least once, at one point in history. In the meantime, Simon was pleased to realise that searching through his many volumes took only half as long as it might have otherwise, and started to wonder if being split in two might not be so... split in two might not be so bad after all. He thought about how much more quickly he'd be, he'd be able to write his own books too. One part of him could read while the other transcribed what he read at the exact same time. One part of him could run errands around town and hobnob with the townsfolk while the other stayed home and worked on his studies. One part of him could have tea and cakes with Valerine, while the other kept Anton company in the study. Simon looked up from one of his books and then looked over at himself. His face mirrored the same look of shock from either direction, and so he tried twice as hard to force that train of thought out of... <coughs> 
as he tried twice as either from either direction and so he tried twice as hard to force that train of thought out of his mind surely he thought to himself there were plenty of downsiders to being a fox divided and once he managed to think of one or two he'd been able to tell himself for sure yes let's get for sure yes let's get back together After, ri after rifling through spellbook after spellbook, Simon came across only one spell in particular that allowed a wizard to split that allowed a wizard to split somebody in two, but it did so only in the physical sense, with results that were quite <coughs> in the physical sense, with results that were quite <coughs> But it did so only in the physical sense, with results that were quite bloody. It was with results with results that were quite bloody. It was also under the current guidelines of the magician's charter forbidden charter forbidden and punishable by horrific means. Simon was very much alive and unbloodied and <clears throat> and unbloodied and Anton hadn't uttered the required incantation in old so in old Sontrianic. So that certainly wasn't the spell. So that's <coughs> so so that cer so that certainly wasn't the spell that had been used on him. It was clearly used on him. It was nearly dawn when Simon finally closed a copy of Magical Oddities of the civilized age and stood up. I think that sleep is in order, he said, distracting his other self from his copy of The Compendium of Hexes, Volume 9. I suppose you're right, he said, closing the second book, leaving it atop the table as he went to follow himself off to bed. He felt drained, both physically and metaphysically, and he <clears throat> he felt drained both physically and metaphysically and he wasn't up to trying to fend off that tiredness twice it wasn't until simon got to his room though that he realized the problem of sleeping arrangements he looks down at the bed then up arrangements he looks down at the bed then up at himself and smiled a tired and awkward smile so how should we do this then? I suppose we just both pile on. I suppose we just both pile on in, he said, motioning to the bed with a paw. It's not with a paw. It's not like there's anything to be ashamed of. Simon was still hesitant, though, and neither of him, hesitant, though, and neither of him got into the bed. It just seems a bit odd, is all. <clears throat> Gone to the bed. It just seems a bit odd is all, he said. Why's that? Well, you know, he tried to tell himself, because he gave himself, he gave, because he gave himself, uh, because he gave himself an incredulous look. Oh, no, you're not doing this, he said, scolding. You can't keep lying to yourself. What am I lying to myself about? He asked, folding his ears back as he felt his voice squeak and crack due to his overdone sense of protest. You're just afraid to get so close to another male, aren't you? He said. The fox's eyes widened with shock first, and then he with shock first, and then he furrowed his brow. I am not, he stated. What if I said that you were just afraid to get so close to another fox? Both of his tails now twitched with agitation. Now that's just ridiculous, he said, yipping the word ridiculous, caught off guard by, caught off guard by his own logic. Why, why would I ever be afraid of that?
I didn't say it made sense, he said. That doesn't prevent it from being true. That doesn't prevent it from being true, though. It doesn't make it true either. It's an idea, he said. And then, to put emphasis on the point, he stripped down to his undergarments and crawled into bed. He looked back up at himself expectantly and then expectantly and then tilted his head. <clears throat> and then tilted and then tilted his head. Just come on, he said. You can't worry about yourself like this. Just get into bed <clears throat> like this. Just get into bed, get a good <clears throat> just like this. Like this. Just get into bed, get a good night. <clears throat> Like this, like this. Just get into bed, get a good night's sleep, and tomorrow you'll be able to think more clearly. Simon just stood there, though, gazing down into the bed, looking at the vulpine from filling the sheets, waiting for his other half to just get over his own, to just get over his own insecurities and join him. He stared, close to the mesmerised by the sight, and as he reached up to close to close to mesmerized by the sight, and as he reached up to unbutton his collar, his paw faltered. What's wrong? he asked from the bed. I was just thinking, he replied to himself, arms dropping back to his side, thinking about his words dried up, and his other self looked to be and his other self looked to be at a loss of figure out, at a loss of figure out what they could have been. Thinking about what, he asked. Just about how I've never actually gotten into a bed with anyone. With anyone, he replied, searching his own eyes, feeling sympathy for himself, feeling sympathy for himself, pouring back on him as his worried, timid gazes met. They both kept still, breathing in tandem, in the near dark, the sounds of birds chirping, faintly audible outside. Maybe that's what you're scared of, he suggested to himself. Maybe, he said, and then he turned around. You should get some sleep, he said after looking. You should get some sleep, he said after looking away. I think I'm going to get something to eat first. I don't think it works that way, he said softly, watching himself head for the door. He knew that he couldn't lie to himself about not being tired. I'll just go to sleep on the couch then. You're listening to the Saturday Evening Radio Show News with Alex Fox, Furry Down Under Special.